Alright, it's me, it's me, it's PSP. <laughs> That's terrible. Uh, today, I'm going to be attempting, attempting, a one-man podcast. Why? Because I'm bored and I've got nothing better to do. That's about it. Today, I'm going to be discussing the superstar shakeup of 2017. Along with some other tidbits of wrestling news that I've come across for no reason other than than to fill time talking about stuff. So we're going to quickly get underway with Raw. First off, we got Miz and Maurice coming over from SmackDown Live. Now, Miz was probably the best thing going on SmackDown since the start of the draft of last year. He's been phenomenally consistent with his promo work, all his just hilarious heel tactics and whatnot. Good stuff all around from him. Glad to see he's getting promoted to Raw. Kind of fearful that he might get lost in the shuffle. But at the same time, not really, because, you know... He's proven it. He's good enough that he can hang anywhere he may go. I'm really hoping that in the near future, they will push him back into the main event. I feel that's where he belongs. It's been far too long since he's had a world title. And he's far too deserving to go this long without getting his quote-unquote just reward. For all the hard work he's put in. I mean, the guy trained Daniel Bryan and brought John Cena and Nikki Bell together. What what more could you ask from a WWE superstar? The guy is gold. You gotta push him. <laughs> then then we have Bray Wyatt, who is coming over to Raw from SmackDown. Uh, very shortly after a well, very sh- brief World Heavyweight Championship run. It's kind of surprising, but I guess they really just want to end the Orton feud as quickly as they can. And I don't know if there will be a blow-off match between those two or not, because I can't keep up with Roddick nowadays. So they're either moving him over quickly to spare us from that, Or it'll be like, I don't know, last year I think there was one match between two guys that got drafted to the different shows as like a blow-off before they were officially on their own shows. I can't remember. It's not something that really stuck out. I think it happened. It might have not. I might be just crazy. But yeah, Bray Wyatt comes over to Raw. I'm not sure what they're going to do with him without the Wyatt family. I mean, Bray is on Raw, but it seems like they've... It seems like they're content doing their own thing with Braun. And I don't know if they're going to shove him back with Bray Wyatt, because, you know, that might kind of anchor Strowman more than it would help either of the two. So, very interesting to see that Bray will be coming to Raw. Not sure what they have in store for him, if anything. You know, I'm not a fan, but I think I think they're gonna they're gonna try to do something with him. You know, he has it, it's potential to be a main event guy. You know, I wouldn't put him there, but that's seemingly where they wouldn't mind having him. So, yeah. Bray Wyatt and Braun Strowman reunion I don't see happening, but a push for both of them, I think that's possible. And let's see now. To the woman, Alexa Bliss comes over to Raw, gets promoted and rightfully so. Alongside Miz, she's probably the top face, well, Top heel, I suppose, of SmackDown. 
just excellent work from her. She's so consistent with how evil she can be. She's such a fun character. Really, just one of the absolute highlights of 2016 was Alexa Bliss's entire run on the main roster. Just fantastic character. Fantastic ring ring work. You know, not like on a technical level. She's not like Trish Stratus level yet. Though she may well be the second coming of Trish. But all the performances she's put forth, they get her character over and they get the other characters over. Just, yeah. I've been no nothing but impressed with Alexa Bliss since her heel turn in NXT and now up to the main roster. She hasn't been flustered one bit, I feel. She's just probably the most consistent female competitor in the WWE aside from Charlotte Flair. Which is really saying something because Charlotte is like the best performer they have right now. Alexa is one of the best characters they have right now. So I'm very excited to see Alexa Bliss coming over to Raw. Hopefully she takes the title off Bailey. And you know, if anyone can establish Bailey as a character you should get behind, it's gonna be Alexa Bliss. She can get anything over. I have no doubt in that. Bailey, she's just stagnating. In my opinion. My eyes, I just can't connect with her. I I don't feel that Bailey should have a championship around her waist right now. I barely feel like she should have been called up, which is really sad. Cuz you know, I'm a fan of Bailey. I enjoyed her work. I enjoyed her stuff in NXT, but on the main roster, I'm just not feeling it. Her promos have been very bland. Her ring work is getting very samey. It's almost a Daniel Bryan effect in a way where she got to a top position and now she's just doing the same the same basic match every time she goes out there. And she's in, like Cena in a way now that she's a baby face that never loses no matter the odds, no matter the competitor. She's always going to win. And you know, I don't think that's what the Bailey character was in NXT and I think that's why I feel she's kind of damaged on the main roster now. But if they put her in a program with Alexa Bliss, I think they can fix everything. I think they, those two can build the women's division on Raw to what it should have been with Charlotte over there. And joining the women's roster on Raw is Mickey James, which kind of surprised me. Honestly, I kind of forgot that Mickey was around. You know, no fault of Mickey. I just can't watch wrestling, you know, because I work grave shifts, which means I'm working early nights in the mornings. So I have to be asleep when Raw is on, so I can never watch it. Unfortunate for me, but that's life. I try to keep up with the wrestling, but eh, kind of hard to do. Yeah. Mickey James joins Raw. Not sure what they'll be having her do, because I think she's a heel. And I don't know, it'd be kind of hard to work with Mickey James as a heel when you already have Alexa Bliss and Sasha Banks, who should hopefully be having a heel turn soon. I don't know. Maybe if they just put Sasha Banks in the corner, they can go all out with. Alexa, Bailey, and Mickey. But they seem content with putting Sasha out there, so I think it's going to be kind of a power struggle to get everyone on TV. I mean, they've got Nia Jax over there as well, so yeah, there's going to be a lot of struggle for screen time between all those participants in that division. I mean, with Emma and Dana Brooke as well. Uh. Moving down the list, we've got Dean Ambrose, Intercontinental Championship, or Championship Holder, which I completely forgot about until I googled up the list of the Superstar Shake-Up results. 
and I'm happy to see the Intercontinental Championship on Raw. It's probably my f- favorite belt of all time, and I'm glad to see it back on its in its rightful home, the A Show. But Dean Ambrose is champion. Dean Ambrose coming to Raw. I have no strong feelings one way or another, particularly. Because Dean just doesn't really entertain me. I think he peaked in his feud with Rollins back when the Shield first broke up. And Rollins became champion. And Dean... uh, What was Dean? No, no. Rollins was Mr. Money in the Bank. I think. I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, my memory's a little sketchy, but yeah, that first initial feud they had, that was where Dean was at his best, and that was where Dean peaked, and he has never been the same since. Probably never will be, I don't know. Uh, it's a complicated case, Is I'm not a fan of his wrestling. His character is kind of all over the place. In a way, not really my cup of tea, if you will. I, I think it's a good shakeup in a way, <laughs> but I don't know. I'm not really excited for it one way or another. I'm not certainly not down on it one way or another because it seems like there's going to be an inevitable Shield reunion coming up, or maybe there won't be, and they're just teasing the internet. Who knows? I don't. I don't work there. But yeah. I see title on Raw. Yay. Dean and Ambrose on Raw. Meh. Couldn't care less. Could probably care more. But yeah. <laughs> Moving down. We got Apollo Crews joining the Raw brand. Which was an interesting move, in my opinion. Apollo was brought up from NXT way too early. He debuted the night after WrestleMania of last year. And it was just way too soon for him. He's just... He was just far too green in terms of his overall ring presence. I mean, there was that one time he got beat up backstage and then came out for his match smiling. Smiling as if he was just handed a basket of flowers from God himself. Who said, hey man, I like you. Go out there and wrestle your best match you can wrestle. And he was like, oh my god, literally, I just got handed a basket of flowers. And he just told me to go out and have my best match. I'm gonna do just that with a big ass smile on my face. No, it was just so bad. Just terrible rookie mistake. And... I am a fan of Apollo Crews. I think he's got great physicality. I think his cardio is pretty darn terrible. He really needs to work on that. But the athleticism he brings is fantastic. There's, I think, literally nobody else on the roster like him. So I think if he can etch out a spot on the Raw roster for him, he'll basically have a job as long as he wants one there, unless he gets terribly out of shape or whatnot. But I, in his current form, I suppose, I just don't see him really going anywhere. I think I, it seems like they see potential in him, so he'll definitely be a part of, like, number one contender battle royals like he has been on SmackDown for basically his entire career. But I don't see him ever progressing past that level. You know, maybe he'll have a championship match against the world champion, but he he won't win it in his current state. I'm eager to see what they do with him on Raw. I just don't think he's going to go anywhere. I think he'll get lost in the shuffle. And honestly, I think there are more guys on Raw that are more deserving of TV time than he is at the moment. I mean, really, the entire cruiserweight division needs more focus than Apollo Crews does, so yeah. There's 
only so much you can do with three hours, apparently. And pushing Apollo Crews, unfortunately for him, I feel that pushing him should come behind pushing other talents. Also coming to Raw, Heath Slater and Rhino. What a year for Heath Slater. He went from being undrafted, undrafted in the first Superstar draft, whatever they called it, back in 2016. And now he's like, he was one of the first guys to be brought over to Raw, along with his man beast, the Rhino. I've got high hopes for Heath Slater. I'm a big fan of his. I thought his gimmick as the undrafted talent was fantastic. It kind of can't go anywhere anymore because he, you know, he won his contract, he won the championships. There was really nowhere else for him to go. And it's basically the same as it is now. I don't see him going much further while he's shackled to Rhino. But I think when they inevitably break up, that he has the potential to really go places. It's not like he's the world's greatest wrestler or anything, but like the aforementioned Alexa Bliss, he's a fantastic performer, a fantastic character. He can really work the crowd. He, he's got a lot of talent in a lot of other respects. And, you know, I, I, think, I think there's a lot of potential for him. I'd like to see him go some places. Maybe even a run with the IC title. Who knows? But as for Rhino, you know, he's just, he has to stay strictly a tag team wrestler at this point. I don't see anything in him without Heath Slater, which is kind of funny to say. <laughs> After they break up, I just don't see anywhere for Rhino to go. He'll probably, I don't know, go back to NXT, I guess. Like the rookie that he is. That young, up-and-coming, blue-chipper Rhino. Poor guy. Uh, up next, we've got Kurt Hawkins making his... I think it might be the first ever time he's been on Raw. I, for all the other years that he's been under contract with the company, I think he's only ever been on SmackDown. So this makes it his first jump to Raw, and I'm not really sure why. Heck, I'm not even sure why they brought him back at all. I'm not sure that they've been doing anything with him. It's like, he has that weird little Tyson Kid type fact gimmick, I think. But I'm not certain, because, you know, I can't keep up with the product. I haven't seen much from him. I just don't really see a future for Kurt Hawkins on Raw, or even on SmackDown. I guess he's just going over there to enhance some talent on the Red Show instead of the blue one. So, who knows where that goes. I certainly don't, but I don't see him going anywhere. Also. The Drifter, Elias Sampson, debuted on Raw, which is kind of interesting. I was wondering if they would have him drift over to SmackDown as well, but it doesn't seem like they're going to do that. Kind of sad. I would have liked to see him dri literally drift between both shows and just start beating people up like Keith Slater did until he gets a contract with one of them. Then leave that com uh, not company, but then leave that show for the other show anyway. Nobody would trust him after that, though. <laughs> yeah, Elias Sampson from NXT followed Corey Graves all the way over to Raw. Corey seemed quite happy. I was quite happy for them. Big fan of their relationship. Hope to see it go places. Uh, Elias Sampson as a character, I think he's, I think he's really good, actually. Not really a fan of his ring work. Haven't seen much of his ring work, though. I know he's just an NXT guy, so I don't expect great things, but I guess some of my forum buddies were saying 
they enjoyed his matches, so I'm willing to give him more than the benefit of the doubt. I've got high hopes. You know, I have high hopes for basically everybody, just because I want to see people actually succeed instead of seeing the same stuff over and over again. But yeah, Elias Samson is a character I can get behind. And the fact that he is a character, that that's more than good for me. Because we need more characters in wrestling. That's an absolute must. And also, from NXT, I think the last guy on my list here, Ty Dillinger. The Perfect Ten. Absolutely, extremely happy to see him finally on the main roster after being in NXT for so long. You know, and being in ECW as Gavin Spears before that back in 2009. Long journey for him. Just fantastic worker. Great, great gimmick. Uh, I definitely preferred him as a heel, though. But I, at the same time, it's kind of hard to root against him. You know, I enjoyed seeing him, seeing him be the heel, but I was always cheering him, so maybe this was just a natural, inevitable transition. Almost, It's almost like Daniel Bryan's Yes chant. You know, he started the Yes chant as a heel, but the fans were like, this Yes chant is so stupid that it's awesome and easy to chant. We like this guy now. We're going to cheer him. And we're going to chant Yes at every show. That's that's basically the origin of Daniel Bryan's success. Now that Ty Dillinger is going out there shouting 10, the fans love it. And they love chanting it. So you know, hopefully he can ride some momentum straight up to the main event. Because... You know, that's where a guy his caliber belongs, darn it. I'm not sure if they finished up his run in NXT yet. Don't know if he'll have any real finish to his feud with Sanity. Which is unfortunate. You know, I know I use unfortunate that word a lot. I mean, if you watch the last Shut Your Mouth Lounge I did with Addy... I was saying unfortunate like every other word, but darn it, I have a very limited vocabulary when I'm talking out loud, so you're just going to have to deal with it. Yeah, it's a shame. Synonym that I don't think we got the closure on the Sanity feud. I would have really liked to see a closure to it, but I don't know if we could have gotten quote-unquote, the closure that it needed, so maybe it's best that he did just transfer over to Raw. Because, you know, where else could he possibly go in that feud? I'm not 100% sure. Shout-out to Nikki Cross for being, like, the best character over there now. But, yeah, I think that wraps up Raw for this superstar shakeup. so I'll quickly go over SmackDown, starting with the best. Charlotte Flair being sent over to SmackDown Live to replace, or rather, fill the void left by Alexa Bliss. You know, once Alexa Bliss got drafted over to Raw, I knew this was coming. Because, you know, you can't have those two on the same show. They're kind of the same character, but in very different ways. Alexa Bliss is a little rabid wolverine, and Charlotte's just, well, obviously the genetically superior combatant of the ring. Charlotte is probably the best performer on the planet today. Any company, any division. I don't care who you are or what you're saying, Charlotte's the best. And that's a fact. So Charlotte fills a void left by Alexa Bliss. Hopefully, she will take the title off of Naomi as soon as possible. I, fe I feel that Naomi was a wrong decision that they made. They probably made it knowing how the Superstar shakeup was going to go. I don't know how long they've been planning this. Maybe it was spur of the moment. I don't know. But, yeah. 
Naomi winning the championship from Alexa Bliss was a mistake the first time. Then she got injured, which saved us a couple weeks. But then she came back and won the title again at WrestleMania. Which, I guess, since it was in her hometown of Orlando, they wanted that quote-unquote feel-good moment. But I didn't feel good. I felt kind of pissed off. You know, Alexa Bliss was the best thing going on SmackDown, aside from The Miz. So to see that her hard work wasn't really rewarded, even though it kind of was, I just felt that... Giving the title to Naomi was not the right decision. Naomi isn't fleshed out enough. She doesn't have the character or really the uh, what's really the draw in my opinion to be a champion. So, if Charlotte takes the belt from Naomi and they enter a program together, you know, I think Charlotte can bring anybody up to her level both in the ring and as a character. So, hopefully Charlotte basically wins the championship and holds it until next year and builds everybody she faces up to her level so that she can really establish the women's division on that show. Is You know, I don't remember the SmackDown roster off the top of my head. I, they've got Becky Lynch... Uh, Naomi and Tamina, I know that for certain. Oh, and Carmella, but I don't think she really wrestles. Well, not to say that she can even wrestle, because she's pretty freaking terrible. But, uh, regardless, I'm not sure if anyone is really suitable to face Charlotte as a top face. So... Yeah, Charlotte needs to win the championship to establish those other guys, or girls rather, as top contenders. Charlotte being champion will build those others up to her level. And if it doesn't, then maybe Charlotte's not as good as I thought she was, but maybe it's just the others that suck. I don't know. <laughs> I'm speaking purely theor theoretics here. So, aside from Charlotte, we got New Day. New Day is going over to SmackDown Live. I'm not sure if it's good to have them on SmackDown just to separate them from Enzo and Cass on Raw. Because maybe I would rather have two obnoxious teams on one show so I don't have to deal with them on the other. Maybe the two obnoxious teams were just taking up too much time on the three-hour show, so they had to disperse it a little bit. But yeah, I'm not a fan of New Day. All their content is basically the same juvenile stuff they've d been doing for the past, what, two years now? I'm not 100% certain. But, just, I don't have any faith that they'll pull out anything new or give me any reason to care about them. Uh, as singles competitors, if they were to break up sometime this year, I think Big E has potential. The other two, Kofi and Xavier. Uh, Kofi, I think he's a lost cause. He's had multiple pushes. He's been given the ball multiple times, and he's just fumbled with it every time. So I think they're done with him. There's not much they can do. He's not really salvageable, in my opinion. But Xavier Woods, he's got talent, but I'm just not a fan. I mean, they paired him with R-Truth, who I love, but I still couldn't really care about him. So, that's pretty sad for him, but, you know, maybe one day he'll prove me wrong. So, of the three, Big E has most potential, obviously, because he's big. But, aside from that, New Day's on SmackDown, nothing much left there to say. It basically says itself. Now, we've got Kevin Owens. Uh, what is he? United States Champion. 
He's bringing that title over to SmackDown now. The B Show, where it belongs. Yeah, I'm not... I haven't really been a fan of Kevin Owens as of the late. Well, not really as of the late, but basically since... Uh, let's see, the Raw draft of last year. Basically, after his fantastic payback match with Sami Zayn, it's been all downhill. He was very underwhelming as the Universal Champion. You know, they had to put him with Chris Jericho to basically save him. Funny. <laughs> save him when Jericho's... Yeah, that that's terrible. I, I might have just done a... I might have done a terrible pun there. Save us, Y2J. Yeah. If you haven't pieced it together in your head, then we'll just move on now. Kevin Owens was saved by Chris Jericho in his basically just abysmal run as Universal Champion. Kevin Owens was the guy holding the championship. Chris Jericho was the one making the championship. Chris Jericho was the draw, the reason anybody even remotely cared who the champion was, in my opinion. I didn't find Owens entertaining as champion. You know, he was good at... They were good as a duo. But Kevin Owens just wasn't the right choice to hold the championship. And, you know, it was basically proven every time Owens and Jericho went out there. And Jericho was always the guy. Owens was playing second fiddle to the... Sidekick. That really says something about his run. You know, maybe there are people out there who enjoyed his championship run. I did not. I found it underwhelming. I found it abysmal. I was very unimpressed, and I was disappointed that they rewarded such a terrible run with another championship. Although of a lesser caliber, far lesser, since it's the United States Championship. I just feel that there are other more deserving talents there that should have the spotlight as opposed to Kevin Owens because they've gone out there and they've proven it that so many people have shown that they can consistently put on the better matches, the better promos. But Kevin Owens, somehow, some way, he's still just kind of holding on to somebody else's spot. Think, you know... If there's any justice, somebody will take his spot, and he'll have to actually work his way back into relevancy. As it stands now, just not a fan of Kevin Owens. Just can't really get behind him. He hasn't had a good match in quite a while. But yeah, this is just me harping on Owens, and maybe that's not fair of me, because I haven't seen his entire run. But what I have seen, it was always Jericho pulling his weight. Now, speaking of weight, we'll move over to Lana and Rusev. There we go. There's the weight that I was talking about. Rusev and Lana are going over to SmackDown. I, I'm not 100% sure what they're doing with that. Because I saw like a vignette for... An upcoming debut of Lana. It looks like they took an Eva Marie gimmick and slapped it on, slapped it on her, which is fine because I think they both have the same skill level at the moment. But I'm not sure why they want to make Lana a character in the women's division when she. I feel that she should be helping Rusev out to regain some of the heat that I feel he's lost. I think the move to SmackDown is great for Rusev. It will give him a chance to kind of rebuild himself. Because he's lost so much steam. And I'm not, you know, I don't think he'll ever get back to that point that he was at when he was feeding with Cena. And, you know, that seems like kind of an obvious thing. But if he could, I think he would need Lana to accomplish that. So, SmackDown gives him a second chance to kind of rebuild his character, become the true Bulgarian brute again, gives Lana a chance to kind of get him over. Maybe she'll be getting herself over 
as a female competitor, but I'm not certain, you know. Those vignettes weren't exactly clear in what she would be doing. It could be another Emilinas type thing. Who knows? But, yeah, I think it's a good move for Rusev and Lana, depending on what they do with the two. If they're just moving him over for the sake of moving him over and they don't do anything with him, like they weren't doing anything with him on Raw, then yeah, it's just a move for the sake of moving and it won't accomplish anything. Now, Sami Zayn, the man with the fantastic theme song, is moving over to SmackDown Live. I was surprised with this and kind of disappointed. His... It, it comes off the heels of Sammy kind of being Mick Foley's, I don't know, almost golden boy in a way. I feel like those two were always doing something on Raw together. But, you know, I'm not really able to watch Raw entirely, so my opinions probably don't account for as much as those of somebody who actually watches the show. So, kind of surprising, kind of... Kind of a, yeah, bland choice for a move. And it kind of devalues any potential that a revisitation of a Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn feud would have. You know, I was just bagging on Owens earlier, and now I'm talking about putting him back with Zayn, but I feel like if they had broken those two up in the draft last year and then brought them back together this year, that could create a buzz and an immediate draw to anything that they could potentially do. But since they've been on the same shows together, there's no anticipation to see that match. No real reason to get excited for those two being on the same show. So, yeah. I feel they're kind of damaged, and they shouldn't revisit a owens Zane feud. But they probably will, since Owens is champion, and they've kind of been toying with Zayn in a way. Up next to SmackDown Live is Sin Cara, who, I don't know, I, I'm not sure that he ever competed in the Cruiserweight division, so this isn't exactly a loss for them. Uh, let's see. Sin Cara. I can't recall him doing anything as of the late. I don't think he was in the Cruiserweight division. I don't think he was on Raw. He was one of those guys who they kind of decided that transcended the Cruiserweight division for reasons unknown to me. Because he wouldn't participate in 205 Live and he would face like Braun Strowman on Raw for reasons the viewer cannot fathom. So it didn't really make much sense. They were kind of using him as a talent enhancement guy. Which, you know, I like Hunico. I I think his career isn't going to go anywhere simply because of the identity he's wrestling under. The Sin Cara character was damaged, I think, irreplaceably by Sin Cara Uno. And I don't know that there's a way to salvage it, and it certainly won't be salvaged at the hands of Hunico, because while I like him, he's more far more consistent a worker than the original Sin Cara, he still doesn't have that power to really elevate the character to anything more than that failed experiment from 2011. So, sad for him, but I don't think he's in danger of being fired unless he starts any backstage fights. <laughs> Who knows, really. Uh, so... He goes to SmackDown, probably doesn't accomplish much. Probably gets moved back over to 205 Live next year. Which, I actually think I missed Callisto. I'm pretty sure he's over on Raw now as well. But I think they'll probably do the same thing to Callisto as they did with Sin Cara, where he's a cruiserweight, but he kind of transcends the division, so he's not going to be participating on 205 Live. I don't know how they worked that out. I'm really not a fan of what they're doing with the Cruiserweights as is. That's a podcast topic for another discussion, 
for another day, maybe. Or if I've got time, I'll get into it now. Or, well, not now, but later on down the line. But Yeah, someday I'll talk about the cruiserweights and everything that's going wrong with them. But for now, we're going to move on to the Shining Stars, Primo, Epico, Prepico. I'm a big fan of those two. I think they've got lots of talent. They've got a good look. They've got, well, they've got some sort of character. I'm not 100% sure what it is. But the fact that they've got character is good enough for me. This was an interesting decision, I think. It, it could be that they're actually going to utilize them. It could be a potential, like I was mentioning with Rusev earlier, it could just be a potential switch for the sake of Switch's sake. I think most recently they were used on the Raw that they... No. Yeah, I think it was a Superstar Shake-Up Raw where they were teaming with Gallows and Anderson in a, what was it, eight-man tag match. So, yeah, that's the most recent thing that I can recall of them. But, yeah, big fan of those two. Hopefully they get used. I think they could be a good addition to the SmackDown tag team division. Could be good opponents for American Alpha, but... American Alpha could be great opponents for anybody, so there's also that. But I think the first few months will tell us what they're going to do with the Shining Stars. And if they don't do anything with the Shining Stars in the first couple of months, then it's kind of over for them. Not like as in them being fired, but in them potentially breaking out. They'll probably just be stuck doing the talent enhancements for the tag division instead of, like, singles. Now, we've got Jinder Mahal making the move to SmackDown Live. I wasn't even really aware he was on Raw. I, I know that he had a really good match with Cesaro at, like, the Royal Rumble, which was kind of funny because it was an unadvertised match. But it really kind of stole the show for me in a way. I I like Ginger to an extent. He he looks like he's on steroids right now. <laughs> Which I don't know if that helps him or hinders him, but yeah. I suppose he's got a fantastic look at the moment. He actually looks really tall, which I didn't realize how tall he was. I remember when he first debuted, he was going up against Kali, and I knew he looked tall then, but... Man, he he's like looks really friggin' tall now. I need to Google him and see how big he is. Sounds kind of weird. I don't know. Let's move on. <laughs> uh, Jinder Mahal moves over. Don't know what they're gonna do with him, if anything. Because... Seems like they've... They, they think they see something in him, maybe? But I'm not sure, you know? I'm not a regular viewer. I can't really speak on that. I've got hopes for him. If he doesn't amount to anything, I can't say I would be surprised. It's good to see that 3MB are back in the WWE, though. They're just waiting on their reunion tour now. You got Heath Slater on Raw, Jinder Mahal on SmackDown, and... Uh, Drew, what's his face, McIntyre, down in developmental where he should be. Now, finally, last person on my list here, we've got Tamina going over to SmackDown Live. Now, I'm not sure if this is a legi legitimate that she's going over to SmackDown Live, or if that she was on SmackDown Live to begin with and she was just injured for the entire period. Because that may well have been the case. But regardless, Tamina is back, and she's on the blue brand. Curious to see where they go with her. I mean, seemed an obvious choice to put her on SmackDown. Because, you know, Raw's kind of already filled. 
you could say they've got Sasha, Bailey, Alexa, and Nia over there. So I don't really see how Tamina could potentially fit into that roster when I can barely find a spot for her in SmackDown's roster. I enjoy Tamina's work. You know, I haven't seen her work all that much, but she throws a nice super kick, and that's good enough for me. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Awesome super kick. Uh, I think she's got a good physique. I think she's about the same size as Charlotte. Probably a bit smaller, though. So, I'm curious to see if they'll have her work with Charlotte sometime down the line or in the new near future. It's like they've both got that lineage that they could work with. And they're pretty similar in style. Well, not style, but in physique. So that could be a program that they look into. Or it could be something they ignore entirely. And they just kind of waste Tamina over on SmackDown. But yeah, that should fill out my list. That's all the names I've got written down, but the Google searches weren't exactly favorable on me, so there were probably a few I missed. Oh yeah, Shinsuke, Shinsuke Nakamura, Nakamura, however you want to pronounce the name. He's over on SmackDown now, which, good for him. I'm not a fan. I just, you know... It's like, he's the king of strong style, but I find his stuff incredibly weak looking. You know, that his forearms, it, they just don't look impactful to me. And his dumb mannerisms, it just doesn't make sense to me. So, not a fan of Shinsuke. I could be, I could be persuaded, but I'm just not feeling it. But he does come over to SmackDown. Looks like he'll be entering a program with Dolph, which uh, I feel un sorry for Dolph because, you know, he's put in so much work and never really gets a payoff in any way. And now he's putting over the new golden child. Sucks to be him. But, you know. Some of that's his own undoing, so can't really feel sorry for him all the time. Okay. So I think Ty Ty Dillinger, Elias Sampson, and Shinsuke Nakamura were all the NXT debuts of the post mania season of the wrestling, if you will. Now As we were discussing Jinder Mahal earlier, turns out that in a match or segment, I'm not sure which because I don't watch Raw, obviously, as I've mentioned several times in this podcast, Jinder Mahal gave Finn Balor a concussion, which has put Balor out of action for, well, for an amount of time that I'm not up to date on. I just know he's out. So, curious to see how that goes. I mean, he, Finn Balor just came back from a shoulder injury, I believe. And now he is out with a concussion. So, sucks to be him. Hopefully, Ty Dillinger can fill the void. Not that there was really a void to be filled, because, well, like I said, Balor hasn't been around for quite a while. So, yeah. Hoping for some great stuff from Ty Dillinger, obviously. But Finn is injured, which I think throws a monkey wrench into some of their plans. Not sure what they were planning to do to begin with, though. Because, like, he had just re returned on Raw before he got injured again. So, sucks, but that's life. <laughs> Gotta kind of pick up the cards and keep rolling with them. Now, time to discuss the announced teams. Byron Saxton 
no longer on Raw, and he's going over to SmackDown. I'm sure JBL will be pleased. And in Byron's place, Raw is getting David Otunga. Now, well, let's do a quick rundown of Raw's commentary team. You have Michael Cole, an astute professional who has been there for a long, long time. I think he's kind of underrated in a way. You know, I'm not his biggest fan. I certainly won't go out on the field cheerleading for him. But I don't think he's half as bad as the internet may claim him to be, or as bad as he has been in the past. I mean, those heel turn Michael Cole days were dark times indeed. But yeah, he's certainly not a terrible play by play guy, in my opinion. Then you've got Corey Graves, who has easily become probably my favorite voice in wrestling since, I don't know, Bobby Heenan, which is really high praise for Graves. And I think it's well-deserved, though. He's easily, in my opinion, the best commentator they have. Both, <laughs> he can do color commentary and play-by-play -play alone at an announce booth, and he would probably be just as good as, like, anything. Maybe I'm overestimating him, but, yeah. He's probably my favorite, favorite announce guy of all time at this point, and he's just getting started. So, yeah, you got... Michael Cole, who is good. Corey Graves, who is great. And then you've got David Otunga. Which, the less said about him might be the better. I can't claim to have heard any of his recent stuff. I'm kind of thankful to be able to claim that I haven't heard it. But, from what I have heard... Otunga was just a terrible fit in the commentary booth. It's like they had to put Tom Phillips on the SmackDown commentary table, making it a four-man booth, just to kind of put a band-aid on the fact that Otunga was so bad. So, putting Otunga on Raw, I'm just not sure why they did that. I'm not sure why they swapped the announced teams at all, really. Or, well, not really the announced teams, but the two broadcasters that they did. Now, if you're going to swap two around, I guess those are the two to swap, because they're pretty interchangeable. But Otunga, he's just very slow and just uninformative on a whole. He doesn't add anything to the commentary, which is a really big factor in why I don't like him. You know, you can be bland all you want. Like, you know, what's his name? Can't... And Nigel McGuinness. <laughs> yeah, I just forgot the name of one of the best wrestlers ever. <laughs> okay, then. Yeah, Nigel McGuinness down in NXT. Very bland, but at least he gets some stuff across sometimes. David Otunga, just slow, uninformative, not good in really any capacity. So, not really happy to see that he's going over to Raw. But then you've got Byron, who is bland and just as uninformative as David Otunga, and he's going over to SmackDown. I guess so he can dance with JBL or something. Uh, I just don't know why they swapped it around. Uh, it's kind of like a non-topic to me. I just don't have much to say on the matter, aside from the fact that they're clearly not the best at their jobs. 
and I guess this is just my excuse to crap on them. So yay for that. I'm sorry guys, but try harder, I guess. <laughs> like they're even listening to me. But, well, now let's go to the SmackDown's announced team. Because there is some controversy here. We have now Byron Saxton, which you know, he's not good at all, really. So he, I think he has flashes every here and there where it's kind of funny to laugh at how bad he is. But aside from that, no. Then you've got Tom Phillips, who had to be placed there to kind of cover up how bad David Otunga was. And the fact that play-by-play -play kind of wasn't being done for a while. I don't know. Now you also have JBL, who is the color commentator, I think. Which, I don't feel that he really adds anything at all. I just got a text message, sorry about that. <laughs> My unprofessionalism. But if you're expecting professionalism from me, you've come to the wrong place. But yeah, JBL does call it commentary and basically whatever he wants to do. I don't know. Doesn't really add anything to the team. Kind of detracts most of the time. And then you've got Mauro Ranallo. I'm going on record here as being the only living person on the internet to say that I do not like Morrow's commentary. I think it's... I don't know. If you could... If you turn on a Flintstones episode and had Barney or, no, Fred wrestling somebody in a wrestling ring and you had some dude doing commentary over that, it would sound like Mauro Nalo, if you get my meaning. He sounds like a generic sports broadcaster. And I'm just really overall wasn't a fan of his. But the sad thing is here that apparently he's got some mental issues, I suppose. I'm not sure. I didn't read up all that much. But I guess he was brought into depression by JBL's constant bullying in a way. Which really kind of sucks. No, like, I might not like Morrow's commentary, but I like JBL a whole lot less. And between the two, I would much rather have a play-by-play -play guy than a color commenta commentator who I feel most typically does not add anything to the matches or the performers or the product on a whole. So... The big news is that Morrow may not be coming back. Unfortunate is that word again. But yeah, that's life. He wasn't happy. He decided not to come to work, and he's probably not going to return to work. And it's like, I guess all fingers are being pointed at JBL, John Bradshaw Layfield. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this shapes up. I'm curious to see if they'll bring in a new play-by-play -play guy or if Tom Phillips will just inherit the role. I don't know. Could shape up to be pretty interesting. Now, uh, I'm gonna, gonna take a break right here. Because, you know, I've been talking for a while. You've probably already stopped listening. But if you're still there, hello. And goodbye. Because this has been the One Man Podcast with Pink Sparkle Puff, yours truly. I will be signing off. Hopefully you will stick around for future installments of such nonsensory. Because I plan to do these quite regularly. Like I may have previously mentioned, I work grave shifts. so. Basically, my awake schedule is from midnight to 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And since nobody else is up to, to be disturbed at midnight, I'm probably going to do podcasts throughout the entire night. And we'll see how my voice holds up. 
It's going to be an interesting ride. It should be fun. Hopefully there will be a lot of laughs. Hopefully I will get better one of these days. Maybe someday I will be bearable to listen to. But until that happens, you're stuck with rookie me. And I thank you for being along for this, what is assuredly going to be a most tumultuous ride. Thank you for listening. This is PSB signing off. Adios.